scripture reading for today comes from the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. I'll be reading verses 12 to 16. This continues with the sermon series that we are covering on mission and indeed almost continues uh, exactly with where we were last week. I covered material from uh, chapters 3 and 4 last week, and we're picking up in the middle of chapter 5 this week. We find, perhaps surprisingly, that Peter is right back at Solomon's portico as he was last week, although the crowd has grown. So hear now the word of the Lord from Acts 5, 12 to 16. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is God's word. Amen. Pray with me, if you will. Father, we give you thanks that the spirit that you give us in the name of your son Jesus is a spirit of power, and that that spirit can give us the gift of faith, but also that that spirit can bring us the gift of healing in our lives. I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us who are gathered here this morning. Help us to receive him in power. Let our faith be renewed and let all that afflicts us be healed. And all this in the name of the one who is the great physician, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So that scripture passage, which uh, culminates in a word about healing, is setting the table exactly for where I would like to go in the sermon series this morning. But to do a little bit of a recap, let's look on where we've been so far over the course of the past Now, four weeks. The first week that we started talking about mission, we talked about the way in which the Bible reveals to us that the gospel is meant for all people. Now, this is the type of thing that may seem obvious to us now, but at one time it would not have. For indeed, up until the time of Jesus, God's people understood biblically were the people Israel, the Jews. But what we find in the book of Acts through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that even us Gentiles are meant to receive the good news. And that is very much good news for us. And so what we see is that there is a universal call of the gospel. And if there's a universal call of the gospel, then there is a universal call to mission. For all those who are called to be disciples of Jesus are called to be the representatives of Jesus out in the world. We found, secondly, in our second week, that there is also a universal call to repentance. That indeed is the first word of the gospel. It is a call to repent, to set aside all those things that are keeping you from God. The book of Romans has a wonderful way of putting this in chapter 12 that I like so much. It says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. You see, the gospel is a gospel of transformation. It's a gospel that is meant to change us. But in order to transform us, we have to first stop being conformed to the things that are inhibiting that transformation and that transforming work. And then finally, last week, we found that there is also a universal call to new life in Jesus. That is the universal call of faith, for indeed, in the biblical sense, what faith in Jesus means is to receive new life in his name. And we saw that last week through the way that Peter approaches the lame man in the beautiful gate. And the man is just hoping for some alms, for something to get him through the day. But Peter has something much greater to offer him, doesn't he? For he looks down at the man and he says, silver and gold I do not have But what I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
And we found, too, that when you receive that new life in Jesus, it's the type of thing that cannot be hidden. For the council and the temple authorities, who are not very happy with Peter and John, call them in on the carpet to explain themselves. And they don't know what to do with these rough-hewn, unlettered men from the Galilee up from the country that have come into town preaching this powerful message. But at the end of that entire interrogation, the word that's given to us in Acts chapter 4, which I just love, is this. And they could tell that they had been with Jesus. You see, that's what new life in God does. It makes it to where other people have to, have to stand up and take notice of what's going on with you. I mean, what was happening with Peter and John is that they just kind of had Jesus oozing out of their pores. And it could not be ignored. And that's a wonderful thing. Because ultimately, mission is not just about doing good in the world, but it's about being a certain kind of person. It's not just about doing the right things, but it's doing them out of the right motivation. That's how mission will truly be effective. Not when we go out in the world and do good so that we will look good in other people's eyes or so that we'll earn some kind of favor in the eyes of God. That's nothing but bare works righteousness. Rather, it's that we would go out into the world and other people would be able to actually tell that we've been with Jesus. That's when the gospel really becomes compelling, when others can see how different your life has become because of him. Where we want to go this morning is the next state or the next stage or the next step in the biblical work of mission, and that is the universal call to healing. And that's what we see in the scripture passage this morning from Acts chapter 5. This is actually where all biblical mission is driving. It's driving to the work of healing. It is undeniable, and we shouldn't overlook it. There's actually, what I want to point out to you today as a part of this is there's a momentum growing to what's happening here. Mission becomes like a snowball rolling downhill. And you can see at how each one of these calls builds upon another and builds upon another. Each one builds upon the next. There is a real momentum to what's going on here. And there's a momentum indeed to all mission that is actually mission that is done out of the motivation of the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of when I was younger, when I was a little boy actually, and my two older brothers were in Cub Scouts. My oldest brother Robert, when I was about six or seven years old, entered a soapbox derby. I was preaching this sermon this morning to the graduates at 8.30. They were all sitting right down here in the front pew. Started talking about soapbox cars, and it hit me as I was preaching it that they probably didn't know what a soapbox car was. It's a little bit low tech these days. But when I, back in about 1982, man, soapbox cars were the thing. And my brother, the Cub Scout, was building one with my granddad. And it took him a while. But he was going to enter this soapbox derby. I didn't go to it. I don't think I did. I don't remember it. But what I do remember is that I had extracted a promise from my mother, along with my little sister and my other brother, that we were going to get a turn in the soapbox car after he had finished it. It was only after the derby was over, I'm assuming because she was convinced that we would wreck the thing and he would never get to use it. So sure enough, he had the derby. I don't know what place he came in, but he brought that soapbox car home. Now, it looked nothing like that, I can assure you. <laughs> and back in 1982, we sure weren't wearing helmets when we were riding the thing either. But we went down to the bottom of the driveway after supper one evening, and my mom was out there. We lived on top of a hill, and you got down to the driveway, into the driveway, and here's a mailbox, and there's a little slope this way, and there was a great big slope this way. And I said to mom, I want to go on the big slope. And so they got me loaded in there, and they put the seatbelt on me, and there's a little rickety steering wheel. And my mother said, now, Andrew, do you see that stick on your left? And there's a little stick like this on a bolt. And she said, that's the brake. Don't forget to apply the brake when you get halfway down the hill because you got to stop by the time you get to the bottom. You know what I'm talking about, right? One of these wooden sticks that you shove forward like this and the end of it just grinds against the back wheel and that's supposed to stop you. It was an imprecise braking system to say the least. <laughs> So they got me loaded up in this soapbox car, and my brother Barkley thought it would be fun to get behind me and to shove me as hard as he could down the hill. And he pushed me, and I started to feel the momentum building. 
and the wind started blowing in my face, and the scenery started going by faster and faster, and I was about halfway down the hill, and I just remember my mom way up there on top, and I could hear her voice go, Andrew, don't forget the break. And I looked down at the break, and that wooden stick is just a wobbling like this right here. <laughs> and so I grabbed it, and with all my six or seven year old might, I just shoved it forward as hard as I could. And I don't know if there were sparks flying off of that back wheel, but there should have been. And that old soapbox car just got to shaking like this side to side, and it got down to the bottom, and it hit the bottom, and it just started spinning in 360s like this. And I don't know how many it turned, but I do know that at the end, I had the distinct feeling that my stomach was sitting in the bottom of my throat. And I was, <laughs> I was looking back up the hill. <laughs> and I learned a couple of things that day. The first is, listen to your mother. And the second is, never let your older brother be the one who starts you off down the hill in a soapbox car. But I also learned something about momentum that day. I learned about how a soapbox car, uh, when it gets under the power of gravity, is going to build up momentum that is cumulative. It's not going to level out. It's just going to keep going faster and faster and faster. And that is actually what we see in the scripture passage this morning. We see this uh, as it relates to the biblical mission that the apostles are carrying out. They're in Solomon's portico, and that's exactly where they were last week. But what we discover this week is that the Holy Spirit has been at work. Now, there has been opposition against the church, both exterior opposition and internal opposition. There are half-hearted, barely committed believers that have been trying to undermine the church, and the authorities have been undermining the church, but the work of the Holy Spirit is continuing. And you can see that momentum building, that Holy Spirit momentum building by comparing that story that I shared with you last week from the story that I just read to you a few moments ago. For one, last week at Solomon's Portico, we only saw Peter and John show up, didn't we? They were the only apostles who were there. This week, the scripture says all the apostles are present. The momentum is building. Last week, we saw that there was one sick man who was the recipient of the ministry of Peter, the lame man lying there in the beautiful gate. This week, it tells us that there were multitudes of both men and women, and there were people from all the cities or all the villages and towns around Jerusalem who were coming in because they heard about what God had been doing through these apostles. Last week, we saw that there was only one sign or wonder. It was the healing of the lame man himself, whereas this week, we see many signs and wonders. We see God's Spirit being poured out on these entire crowds of people, many being brought to faith and many being healed. There is a cumulative work of the Holy Spirit. There is a momentum that is building, and that is exactly what we should expect out of a Holy Spirit-driven mission when we're engaging in it today. There is no reason for us to think that such things are only limited to the time of the biblical witness. The same Spirit that is active right there in that story is the Spirit who is present in this room right now. Amen? Now, there are two things, there are two outcomes in the book of Acts that we see out of this spirit-led momentum, and I want to mention each of those quickly in turn. One of them is faith. It tells us when it talks about the multitudes of both men and women who are there uh, present in Solomon's portico, this is what it says about it. It says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. In other words, it says that the Holy Spirit is active there, giving people the gift of faith. There are multitudes even, there are crowds who are being brought to a, a living, a saving faith in Jesus Christ. The other gift that it talks about that the Spirit is giving is the gift of healing. There's the gift of faith and also the gift of healing. And that second category, when it talks about people from towns around Jerusalem, it talks about them in relation to healing. It says, the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, my sense about things is that of those two, the one that is easiest for us to grapple with is the gift of faith. I mean, we don't have that hard a time with it. 
I mean, you hear a preacher talking to you about it literally every week. I mean, one of us is going to be up here talking about the importance of a living faith in Jesus Christ. So the idea that Christ is the Son of God, that he has come to bring light into the world, that the light is meant for your life, and that that light is meant to show you the way to eternal salvation, that is the heart of the gospel message. Most of you have already received that gift in your own lives. But what about healing? What about healing? You know, I tend to think that that is a little bit more difficult for people. It's scary to people. Some of you out there think, I don't want to ask God for healing in my life because what if he doesn't give it to me? Or what if he doesn't give it to me at least in the way that I ask and in the time frame that I would prefer? Some of you are out there and you don't know what I'm talking about. This sounds like Greek right now. You're like, I don't need healing in my life. If that's the case, if that's what you're thinking, then friend, you're just not thinking about it hard enough. Because every one of us needs healing from something. Some of us have a chronic illness that we struggle with or or chronic pain in our bodies. Others of us suffer from brokenness in our relationships with our family members, with our friends. Others of us struggle with anxiety and depression in our lives. Some of you out there struggling with addiction right now. Anytime you talk to a room full of this many people in our culture, you know that there are people struggling with addictions of various kinds that can hear you. But why is it, if we think that the gift of faith is spoken about so clearly in the Scripture, if it's so obvious in the Scripture that the gift of faith is something that the Spirit gives, and we accept that, why don't we accept that the Spirit also wants to give us healing? Why would we divide the two in this Scripture passage? Why would we think, well, one of them is something that God gives, but the other one, that's from something long ago? Or that's something we're too sophisticated to think that we need now? There is a pastor out in Redding, California, a pastor of Bethel Church, a man named Bill Johnson, that I've gotten really interested in the past year or so, who is very much into prayers of healing and helping people understand healing ministry. But he also understands this is the kind of thing that scares people. Some people think it sounds like so much magic or voodoo, and so he, he tries to talk to people about it in a very pastoral way. You know what he says that receiving God's healing is like? He says it's like a school of the Spirit. Most of the time, you won't won't receive all that God has to give you in one fell swoop. You certainly won't come to understand it all at once. It's like being under the Spirit's tutelage. It's like going to school, and you have to commit yourself to it. You have to understand that the Spirit is our teacher and that we are his apprentice, and you have to be willing to sit with that. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. God does want to bring healing into your life. He wants to bring healing to your body. He wants to bring healing to your mind. He wants to bring healing to your heart and to your soul. We're going to come forward in a few minutes, and we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a number of things. It's a way by which we remember what Jesus has done for us. We remember his sacrifice, but it's not just that. It's also a place where we meet him through the power of his spirit. We come to the altar and the Holy Spirit comes to us and draws us close to Christ himself. Helps us to commune with him. That's what communion means, of course. Here's what I want to ask you to do this morning. I want you to come forward to receive the bread and the cup. And I want you to come forward thinking about what it is that you need healing from in your own life. And if you will, after you receive communion, just stay for a moment at the altar rail and ask God for that. Or if you've come with somebody, with a friend, if you're sitting next to your spouse, to a loved one, ask them to pray for you. Ask them to grab your hand, lay a hand on your shoulder, just lay hands on you, and just to ask God to give that healing to you in your life. Maybe it's healing from pain. Maybe it's healing from a broken relationship. Maybe it's healing from some type of spiritual affliction. But take a risk this morning. Take a risk for Jesus. Come to the altar and go to God in prayer.
Ask him to heal you. For the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a ministry of faith. It is. But it's also a ministry of healing. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.